how are you this afternoon? I'm doing great. I'm doing great. So I'm Malik, and uh, this is my friend um, Malcolm. He's right here. And so I couldn't uh, start the conversation off without uh, at least bringing him on, because he's the one who introduced me to your music many, many, many years ago. Wow. Okay. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you <man. laughs> Hopefully, I've um, been a fan of yours for a, a while. Um, I just, there's no words. I'm very excited that I actually get to say hello. And to Margie Joseph, I mean, I have your albums. Yeah. Oh, you are too kind. Thank <laughs> you, my darling. Thank you. I have, I have a couple of them here. I have the Stay Still. I have I wrote that. Wonder. Go ahead. Yes, I see. You have more than I do. I lost <laughs> a lot of my stuff in Hurricane Katrina. Oh, no. Oh, no. Yeah, but some friends from over there in London sent me the waxes of um, most of my albums. And I'm just happy. I'm pleased um, to have what I have. I'm, I'm just pleased to be here. Okay. Yes, ma'am. You know, I got you on my playlist a lot. So Thank it's so you. blessed. I feel so blessed right now to be able to say hello and just speak with Margie Joseph. It's a blessing right now. I well, I feel you. very blessed also because if it were not for loyal fans and my family who supports me, even in my down times like this, I, uh, I don't know what I would do. So God has blessed me to have you and many others who love me. And I, I just feel very, very blessed. I'm grateful. Could you, we just get a little bit of background information about you know, your upbringing and how you discovered that you had a voice? Well, it's a story I've told many times and it's pretty consistent. I've loved music all of my life. Um, I guess from a toddler, because I was about three years old when I was on a school program. And it wasn't an elementary school that I attended. It's just that the people in the small community of Gautier, Mississippi, so I sung this song, How Much Is That Doggy in the Window? And that was the beginning of my singing. I must have really had more than a toddler talent because I, from there, it, it just snowballed and into the uh, church choir, then high school and ju junior high, high school chorus, and then my own singing in the mirror, um, listening to Gladys Knight, Sarah Vaughn, Ella Fitzgerald, Billy Holiday. My, my, my father insisted that I didn't listen to one genre. He wanted me to cover all the bases. And um, that's, that's what I did. I mean, it was no such thing for me as voice lessons. It was like the gift had just been given to me innately by God. I was inspired by many men and women. They inspired me. They gave me the courage to know that it could be done. Mm -hmm. And I went after it like a hungry lion. So how did you end up getting to um, Stacks or Vogue? Well, I started actually at uh, a subsidiary of Columbia Records, the OK label. That was my very first recording. This is the funniest story. I was attending Dillard University in New Orleans and some classmates were going to Lou Rawls concert and they met this entrepreneur, disc jockey who brings shows to New Orleans at the Municipal Auditorium at that time. And they told him, it's a girl on campus you've got to hear. 
Her name is Margie Joseph. She can sing. They came back that night and they started saying, you're going to get a call from a Larry McKinley. <laughs> and I said, shut up. Y'all quit going telling people I can sing. <laughs> and he did call and he asked for an audition. And I had these great New Orleans producers, uh, George Davis, Lee Diamond, Willie T known, Willie Turbington known as Willie T, Fats Turbington, his brother, we called him Fats. His name was Earl. So they all were there at the WYLD studio for my interview. I wasn't nervous. I just said, okay, what y'all want to hear? So I sat down to the piano and it was a song I used to love to play and sing. And it was Every Little Bit Hurts by uh, Brenda Holloway. I think that was her name. So I played that and then I could see them all huddling and shoo shooing. And so I said, well, let me take it up a notch because maybe I'm not doing good enough or well enough. So I really started doing my thing from what I had learned from the pros, you know? And uh, he said, that's good. You good, you good. So I got up to leave. I don't beg, okay? Because <laughs> I had to do my studies. My daddy told me, you are going to finish college and you're not going in that business. And I wondered, well, why were you buying me all these records and <laughs> talking to me about singing? So I left and um, they called me said they had some songs and to meet them at uh, Cosmo Studio. The first song I cut was, Why Does a Man Have to Lie? The flip side of it was, anytime you need some loving, just see me. I'm 18, you know, we think we grown. I'm 18, 19 years old. And my dad asked me, what are you talking about? Anytime you see something, you need some love and see you. I said, Dad, that's what they wrote, Daddy. I was only singing what they wrote. <laughs> and um, then um, Larry and his wife uh, became managers. And Larry introduced me to Al Bell and Stax. And Al was very pleased and they uh, Willie T wrote this song, Never Can You Be More Than You Are To Me. Then Freddie Briggs, they were bringing in producers uh, on the Margie Joseph Makes a New Impression album. That was my first album with Stax. And it had the, I had covered Stop in the Name of Love by Diana Ross and the Supremes with my uh, monologue that I decided to write a monologue. You know, I had to be different. With uh, Stop in the Name of Love, I was listening to it recently and I was like, that rearrangement is you completely turned it upside down, inside out. Whose idea was that? Freddie Briggs. I had two producers on that album, Daryl Carter and Freddie Briggs. They were different as night and day. Daryl could hear me singing more of a pop sound. If you've listened to the album, um, How Beautiful the Rain and, you know, Daryl was saying she could be a pop. Freddie wanted me to be hard rock. Every, you can tell the difference in the things that Freddie produced and what Daryl produced. So I had to change these, uh, not demeanor, but I had to go from one side of Margie to the other. And that was something that I was very capable of doing. You give me a country western song, I'm going to sing it. You give me a jazz song, I'll, I'll sing it. Give me a hardcore, oh, Bobby Blue Bland. If you know I covered that song, I'll take care of you. Blue song, I sung B.B. King. So I can sing anything you give me. Freddie went in with that hard rock and at the time Hot Butter Soul came out with Isaac Hayes. And you know, he had similar, we had similar sounds and we were the two hottest artists not artists, albums at uh, Stax. You know what? 
I was kind of naive. It was just fun to me. You know, I wasn't into the business of recording. I wasn't into, hey, give me some music, a song in the microphone, in the good band. And that to me may have been one of my weaknesses because uh, my naivety was just saying, girl, go in there and sing. And that's what I would do. And something else I think is really cool about that album is you're probably aware, but like uh, Temptation's going to take your love. That's um, Randy Briggs. Yeah, Christina Aguilera sampled it. I know. Yeah. And I'm grateful to her. I'm and very I was, grateful. I remember because I, I heard, of course, her album first. And then I, when I was visiting your music, I said, oh, this sounds familiar. And I said, oh, this is where she got that from. Wow. You do the two albums at Stax, um, uh, New Impression and Phase Two. So what was the process from getting from there to Atlantic Records? You cannot, you have seasons in your life. I've learned that, but I didn't know it at the time. But when the transition took place, I was moving on and Jerry Wexler, was the president of Atlantic and it was like, he wanted me, Arif Martin to produce me. And like I'm saying, that's the man that produced Aretha Franklin. They came with it big. They were bringing some heavy songs in there and uh, real musicians like I was used to. It wasn't electronic, I had a symphony. I had the uh, wonderful guys playing, Carnell Dupree, Richard T, Steve Gadd on drums, Bernard Purdy on drums. I mean, I had the best. And if I'm leaving anybody out, guys, uh, you know what to attribute it to. <laughs> but, um, and it was such a wonderful atmosphere. Any studio, I go in, my energy seems to take it over. And I'm seeing that now, Malika, I didn't know this before. I'm talking like a wise woman right now, but I wasn't very wise. I just wanted to sing good music with good musicians. So what was it like working with all those musicians and you work with the Sweet Inspirations also? It was magical. But I was a little bit older and I felt Aretha, Aretha had gone on. She'd moved on, I think, to Arista, another label. And I felt caught up in between because I have the producer, I have the musicians, and some of the songs that uh, I was given sounded like something that they had prepared for her. So I just sung. I didn't take it internally because it was an opportunity for me. But I kind of knew, kind of felt something but that was happening with that, but I didn't let it come to the forefront of what my goal and objective was to do with every piece of music. And I was able to write my own songs and Arif Martin gentle with me. I never had a producer to be gentle. Freddie was hard. Well, Daryl was kind of sweet. Freddie was like, oh, you can hit that note. Oh, you're going to sing this. And he'd get on the piano and he would be doing the background. And I'm looking at him like, okay, how do I process this with this, this guy? But I love Freddie because he he brought stuff out too that I didn't know was inside. You mentioned Aretha. Um, so it, is it because you guys shared some of the same producers? Is that where, like, why some people would say you guys sounded similar? No, I adored her. When they gave me the material, I could hear her and I could hear me. So on the Atlantic 
albums, you may hear me interject some Aretha, but then you're going to find songs on those albums which will reveal the real Margie Joseph when she was singing. So it, it, um, it wasn't about that. It was just something, I had a feeling that that something was going on. Uh, she was gone and I was given her treasures. What, so what are some of your favorite songs from that time period? I like all my stuff. <laughs> Oh my God, I had such great producers after Arif. And you know what, Malik? I have just really gotten into me. Mm -hmm. I never would listen to my stuff, but I got some things uh, from my treasure box and I started listening to me. So I like all of my songs. I, I like all of my uh, presentations of the songs, my interpretation. So one night I looked up to my creator and I said, wow, I really could sing. There is, hear the words, feel the feeling. Lamont Dosia. Yes, that is cotillion. So, and then there's this, an album in 78. Feeling my way. Two slave masters. <laughs> <laughs> they, make, they make you sing. Baby, do they make you sing. You can cry about how high the note is. If you listen to some of the songs on that album, those albums, I was hitting notes I didn't even know I had in me. And they did not let me surrender or give up. It was no such word as can't with those two producers. After the release of Feeling My Way, there's like a, a break, like a, so what, um, any, what have encouraged the break? Two things. I'm always a mother first. And then the second item was disco. And I didn't catch on to it fast enough. I really wasn't into it. You know, I, some songs that were converted from R&B into disco, there are some songs I liked, but the majority of it, I, I didn't really, I didn't try to do it. And that's where the market was. See, that's why I say there are seasons there, there, and I guess I was in my autumn headed into my winter time. <laughs> I don't know, <laughs> but it was time, and I, sh I shut down for a while to rear my children. Then you come back with knockout. Hey, hey, so the way things happen in my life, I hope it happens again before I leave this great earth. It's like miracles, an ex. Atlantic promotion man stopped by. I call their names because I want them to know I'm grateful to them. Walter Moorhead. And he said, I have a friend in Houston that has a label. He wants to record you. Well, by that time, I'm rearing three children. He called him. I'm in my kitchen. I'm trying to get my children's dinner ready. I'm not really processing anything about the recording business anymore. And uh, he called Harvey Lynch and Harvey said, uh, can you fly to Houston? So I said, I got to find somebody to keep my children. I flew into Houston. Well, <clears throat> when we got to the studio, they were recording another person and their interest was like, okay, you sit over there and wait so a little ego started you don't tell me to sit down and wait <laughs> i sat three hours and the guy that the two guys that produced knockout thomas jones the third the late thomas jones the third in fact he wrote a huge hit 
um, old time rock and roll for the Tom Cruise movie and uh, David Witherspoon. They were telling me, yeah, we, we got something for them. You be patient, just don't worry about it. And when they started playing that track, I went into a whole different body, a whole different mind. I knew it would bring me back. And it did. It was just a whole new season. I was back into spring again. And I took advantage of it. You ever got thought he was a knockout? That was the fun part. When you when you play live, when I would perform in live, guys would get up and come up in front of stage and I would point to them and say, oh yeah, baby, you're a knockout. And they, uh, <laughs> one football player from the Miami Dolphins I was playing down there. He came up on the stage and picked me up in the air. I said, oh my God. <laughs> you know, they, everybody thought they were a knockout. And the women didn't get mad at me. I guess they were aff affirming. It was like an affirmation for them. Yeah, baby, I got a knockout, you know. They know I didn't want them. <laughs> <laughs> so then we get uh more records i think what, what the follow-up to that was ready for the night ready for the night oh narda michael walden i was back at cotillion mm -hmm. because cotillion offered me another chance a deal and i could flip that and say i gave them a chance you know i need to start I needed to start speaking like that. And it's good to be humble and know they didn't have to call me back. But uh, they did. And Henry Allen, who had been given the uh, position of president, um, I can remember him saying, you're going to be my queen. And I'm saying, oh, Lord, what, what is this? You know. So I let that go over my head and I'm saying, Narda Michael Walden. And he came up with Ready for the Night. Well, I suggested that they change the lyrics on Big Strong Man. That's on that same album. But it was so much fun recording with, with the two of them, Winston Glass. And Narda would bring some beautiful songs. Take Me Away Tonight. Uh, Stuff will get you in trouble. You know what I mean? <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, Ready for the Night was very good. The track was, uh, they brought Whitney in, I think a couple of years, a year or so later. And there was a similarity in the two tracks, Ready for the Night and hers, I Want to Dance with Somebody. I can hear it. Mm -hmm. You know, and it's okay. I think it's the same producer, correct? Norda right. produced I Want to Dance yes. with Somebody. Okay. That's, I think that was her first album with him. I stand to be corrected, but I believe it was. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So then after we get the two albums and then, you know, there's another break. And then... I was good at taking breaks. When... <laughs> Lunch <laughs> breaks, okay? You took a Snack break. Snack breaks. <laughs> And the next and album they, was one of the best albums for me. <laughs> I yeah. love, I love this next album. That's oh, and then there's Stay with Stay. Ichiban. Mm -hmm. yeah. I don't think John Abbott was too pleased with that album. <laughs> we never finished it. It was released unfinished. I don't know why. I know why. I'd rather not say what I think because it may not be true. It might just be real to me. But the song on the Stay album that I really loved was written by Bobby Womack's brother, Love's Calling. You know that one, mm. Malcolm? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> you hear the words? Do you know what the words say in that song? <laughs> I, I try to remember. I know... Um... I, I like the album from start to finish. Love's it's, Calling was my favorite that, uh, in Cinnamon Rose Cadillac. Yeah, Cinnamon Rose. Yeah, I wrote Cadillac. that. My favorite is um, 
I I gotta have your love. So it was so unfinished. It was so much more that could have been done with that because mm. that was a dance song. I think John was looking for me to do bluesy. I actually, he wasn't there. So I was working with some young producers because I could hear hits on that album. But the project was ended. So it's, it's the whatever happened surrounding that album, is that what encouraged the break again? When you're living, when you're not living in a in the industry's marketable places and you're not in that environment, you will get lost because every year a new artist is coming out and the music was advancing. It was moving. I'm quick to do this. My dad said, get a degree. If anything happens, get a job. I did finish college. I went on to do, uh, to start on my master's and I did, you know, I became an educator for a little while. Then I um, became a Head Start director. Then I became a community resources director for United Way. So I was having fun in the everyday eight to five. I, I wasn't hung up on whether I got back out there or not. It was all about taking care of my children, my family, and keeping my mind active, doing community stuff, you know, just loving anything that I do. I didn't have to have the record industry to make me happy. And I'm telling you the honest to God truth. Did I want to be a superstar? At one time, I did. But if it's meant to be, it'll be. And that's how I kept my life rolling. Were you still singing during this period of time? Yes, indeed. Opportunities were coming that did not involve being in the big limelight, like big arenas and things like that. Things like singing for the president of the largest uh, shipbuilding corporation in the United States had his anniversary. I was asked to do that. Uh, I was always asked to sing on church programs. It took me, in fact, that break took me back to my gospel roots. Then I was speaking. I was trying to do a little evangelism. So the break, the break never hurt me. It just made me strong. I didn't go cuckoo because I wasn't in the record business. I wasn't on the stage. Ah, uh, hey, I'm cool. I got a job. <laughs> good jobs. I had good jobs. <laughs> so, okay. So returning back to your gospel, is that what encouraged you to get back out there and uh, record and release Lattery? It was time. It was time to do a gospel album. And Susan Tapper, my best friend to this day, and I told her, I want to do a gospel album. And she said, well, let's do it. So we put it on our label called Sister Praise. <laughs> and uh, I was told by an old reverend preacher, he said, gospel is not gospel if you don't incorporate the word of God. So when you look at the Latter Rain album, you'll see every song supported by a scripture because we were doing it on our own. And, you know, it was after Hurricane Katrina, had a little PTSD behind her. <laughs> Katrina was not nice. <laughs> And I, uh, I had to get my family settled and, you know, it was a lot going on. 
So I was trying to keep the Ladder Rain project going and Susan was a great support system for me. But I think we both just did what we could do as independents. And I think Ladder Rain is a wonderful album. So, you know, that's where I ended and that's where it stopped for now. This is another miracle. This is how things happen in my life. These producers who once was with VH1 called me and said, we'd like to do a documentary on your life. I'm saying, I haven't done anything. What's wrong with y'all? Don't waste your money on me. You need to go find somebody else. So I thought, well, you know, they're kidding. And John Mallow, who is the producer, he said, I really, we really want to do this documentary. So when they started flying down from New York to Atlanta, where I am now, and I saw that they were really serious. In fact, we just finished a couple of weeks ago. So it's an editing process right now. And I asked him, well, what are you guys looking for? And he made the most beautiful statement. He said, the essence of your spirit. We want to talk, we want to show your talent, but the essence of who Margie really is. So I think some miracles are about to occur. I was gonna, um, when you said the funky meters, um, I, it made me think, I, because on, I guess on wolfgang.com, there is, they have a concert where, with you, and at the end, you're singing, uh, Never Can You Be, you're singing, um, Your Sweet Lovin', and a couple of other things, and, um, I recall that live experience from you, and also, uh, with Blue Magic, and Major Harris. Live at the Latin Casino. Live. live. I love me some Margie live. Recently I saw some um, some uh, concert of you at, I, it was sometime in I think 2009. I, I would love to see more live. Can you send that? Because we're looking for live video of me performing because I lost so much in Katrina. Hmm. Yeah, if you can, on YouTube, I definitely link it to you. Please send it. Um, and I'll call John and say, hold up. <laughs> hold up. Don't stop it yet. We got some new material. But that that uh, Wolfgang dot com. Uh, uh, Wolfgang.com is just the audio. It's, it's I, like I know we found it. Uh, well, John, who's he has a uh, an associate that works with him very closely, um, Laura Coxon. She will find anything. I would hate to have any dirt out there <laughs> <laughs> because she'll find it. But uh, they showed it to me. I'd never, never heard it. I remember it though, because we were, when I was in New Orleans filming the last week before last, we went back to that place in Louis, which is now Louis Armstrong Park. And that was called Congo Square. And that area was where slaves were sold and all of that before my time. And uh, that's where that performance was in Congo Square in New Orleans. So that's a treasure for me. I, 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 I also wanted to ask, um, during your Atlantic years, I know you did a lot of touring. Did you, you toured with Al Green? Yes. <laughs> <laughs> yes, I did. Wow. That was uh, about 30 days, I believe. <laughs> nice. Did you, did, what was it, were, were you, did you ever duet with him on the Let's Stay Together song? 
You wouldn't let me sing it. <laughs> oh. <laughs> That's one song I could not do on our tour. That was, and I understand that because that was his hit. Speaking of Atlantic, did you and Aretha ever meet? Of course. I had performed at the Apollo and she was at Radio City Hall. I remember this very vividly. And I wanted to see her. And I bowed to her. And she say, girl, get up off your knees. <laughs> she said, I've been reading about you. I see where the uh, Southern, uh, the uh, New York Times that Monday in the entertainment section said, Southern Bell sets Apollo on fire. Hey, that's when I realized I'm all right. Because the queen has endorsed it. <laughs> So when you compare to the best, you're in my feelings. <laughs> you're going to be compared to somebody. You want to be compared to the best. So what is Miss, Miss Margie Joseph up to today? Six grandchildren. They were all here yesterday. I had my, I have two born in 2018, and one great-grandson born in 2018. The first two make four a month apart. Uh, the great-grandson great makes his four. They are old people. I have never. My five-year-old granddaughter, they asked her what she wanted to be. They were asking everybody at their little pre-K graduation. I mean, the other children were saying doctors and, well, I, you know, way up there. And my five-year-old granddaughter said, I'm going to be a pop star. I said, oh, God. <laughs> and I looked at my son and his wife. I said, ain't my fault. <laughs> and she you can't tell her she, she going to say nothing. So Margie is so busy with those grandchildren and great-grandson, and they were all here yesterday. And I have another one on the way, another grandchild. He will be lucky number seven. I went through a real hard time. I lost my husband. His anniversary, death anniversary is coming up. He was everything to me. And uh, losing him devastated our family. And I had to be strong in the day and crack up at night. <laughs> I couldn't, you know. So I'm recovery. I'm in recovery from not drugs, but grief. Mm. I had a broken heart. There's some things in the works, but... Uh, I'm going to always be mama and grandmama first and great grandmama. That's my life. You can accept things because you have to. You have to. But then there are some things you can say, no, I'm not, agree I'm not in agreement with that. And Marge is going to always do it her way. Well, um, that's... That's it for all my questions and uh, everything. Is there anything you want to say to the viewers before we go? Yes. Thank you. Thank you to each and every one of you that believed in my gift. That made me happy. Like Curtis Mayfield said, I kept on pushing. And God bless them. May they prosper in all the things that they need and some of the things they want. Thank you. Thank you. And I love you. Love you. God back. bless you. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.